Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Connected Families Podcast. I'm Stacey Bellward, and today we are bringing you the conclusion of a special interview that Jim and Lynn Jackson, the founders of Connected Families, had with Lisa Qualls. Lisa is a speaker and a co-author with Karen Purvis of the Karen Purvis Institute. Her book is called The Connected Parent, Real Life Strategies for Building Trust and Attachment. Well, welcome back, everybody, to session two of our podcast series with Lisa Qualls, the co-author of a book called The Connected Parent that she wrote in partnership with Dr. Karen Purvis and the Empowered to Connect group published this, Lisa, through Harvest House. Is that right? Yes, the book is published through Harvest House. Yeah, and we spent our last discussion really kind of looking inward at the parent's heart, what we call the foundation. You have this thread weaving through almost every chapter about the importance of parents uh, attending to their own calmness, their own truth statements, their own work to get in the closet, to get in the bathroom, to go on the porch and and come to their children with not just a calm voice that's quiet, but a calm spirit. It was a rich and valuable time. And I hope if you didn't hear it, you go back and listen to that. But today we're going to, we're going to really get into the outline of some practical parts of the book, Lisa, that you really have written your story of how you dealt with chronic fear, how you work toward the nurture of your children, looked at sensory needs. So we're going to dive into that. And Lynn, I know as a parent coach, as we were prepping for this session, you said almost every parent that I talk to, we deal with fear. So say a little bit more about that and then really hone in on what you'd love Lisa to share with us. Well, as I help parents, it really does help them so much to realize that when their child is coming out with big, angry fight responses, there's, there's almost always fear underneath anxiety, whether it's from heightened sensory sensitivities or just some family dynamic things, or they could be extremely bright and that's stressful on their brain, but there's stress and fear underneath nearly all misbehavior as part of that cocktail that ends up with a child making poor choices. And so it's very helpful and practical for parents to realize that and even think through what are the ways that my child is afraid and what could I do about that? And so, you know, what was your experience with this, Lisa, in terms of when you first really understood that? And then how did that impact how you responded to your kids? I think one of the first ways I began to really see this with my own eyes was with my daughter who had experienced so much food deprivation. So her history was that she had been starved, basically, Mm. and that she really saw her siblings as competition for every resource from food to love to the favorite pink shirt, whatever it was, because she was a survivor. Now, I know not all of your people are adopting, you know, bringing children into their families from that, but even children who've experienced other difficult events in their lives, you know, it can raise their fear level so they can easily be popped right up into that fearful space. They can become, I think, more, I don't know if fragile is the right word, but they can go more into that fear response really quickly. And so with my daughter, I had to learn that when she felt hunger, like physical hunger, she very quickly escalated into I'm starving, I'm going to die. And so obviously she wasn't saying these things. What we were seeing was behavior, screaming, yelling, throwing food choices on the floor, and also just kind of this panic state. So once I understood that there was this river of fear running through her body, you know, that's what it really seemed like with her. Then my goal became to get ahead of her need so that she didn't have to get to that fear state. So in terms of food, we started doing things like putting little baggies of beef jerky in her pockets. So at school, during recess, she could eat. During like right after school, she could eat. I also learned that when she came home from school, before I even spoke to her, hardly, you know, I I would greet her a little. But before I started talking to her, I would give her food. So I had to learn that for her, to disarm her fear, I had to stay very quiet, very calm, and meet that physical need very quickly. So that's just one example. But now having teens, I see so much with them that when they are angry, it's usually not really anger. It's usually some fear, often something peer related, not even related to me so much, but I have to try to calm their fear before we can move forward with anything else. 
So Lisa, I'm reflecting on many parents that I've spoken with over the years who hear something like this and, and will say to me, but at what point do you stop coddling your kids that way and just get them to buck up? Like our kids have got to be tough. It's a hard world out there. At what point do we just put our fists down and quit allowing this nonsense? I would say never <laughs> because I just this morning, my husband and I had an interaction and we're learning a lot about attachment and marriage and all these things. And <laughs> we had this great morning. And then all of a sudden, just as he was leaving and I was getting ready to work, things got really bumpy and not good. And I realized right after he left, I had to text him and say, Oh, that didn't feel good. We got to reconnect there. But he had gone a little bit into fear mode and I had gone into a little bit of fear mode. We were both getting a little amped up in our brains about the day and it just broke our connection. I mean, not permanently, but it, you know, it just yeah. put us not into a good space. So I don't think it's ever coddling to recognize the need beneath the behavior because we want to teach our kids to begin recognizing it. Like even this morning, like I was saying, I thought, wow, why do I feel like this? Why does my body feel like this? And I realized that something work-related had happened and that that had gotten me dysregulated. So I think we always want to continue to do that. And I want to teach my kids to do that for their friends, their spouses in the future, their own children. Yeah, I love what you said about that. I've been learning more about enteroception, which is that perception within the body of all your physical organ sensations, but also where emotions reside. And even the need to go to the bathroom resides or hunger resides. And teaching kids to tune into that keeps them out of that crazy spiral and kind of into what's real. Because yes. we lose that in fight or flight. When we're in danger, it's not time to go, gee, am I hungry? Am I anxious? It's just time to slug or run. So when we help kids tune into that, that perception in their body of what's going on, that helps them automatically to regulate. So that was really cool that you were talking yeah. about that, but also talking about passing that on to your children. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so important. I mean, I, even with my kids will come home from school and they'll tell me something about a fellow student and something that happened. And I'm like, wow, I wonder what was really going on there. You know, we can, as my teens, they are so perceptive because they've just been steeped in all of this. They, yeah. Yeah. you know, they make fantastic camp counselors and lifeguards and all <laughs> kinds of things because they actually understand yeah. How to bring a child into calm and regulation. Yeah. Well, yeah, they see the layers, right? That you, they you've, do. Taught, you've taught your children as they grow to see beneath the surface of presenting behavior, yes. the layers of attachment issues, trauma that happened today, trauma that happened yesterday, trauma that happened in childhood, unknown trauma, you know, maybe of all kinds, you know, and in the day and age that we're in with so many different sort of external stressors slash traumatizers for folks at different levels. What an important thing to grow awareness in, you know, both as, as people ourselves, but then to teach and model for our kids so that they can be learning and growing that way too. Mm -hmm. And I love that this topic of chronic fear leads us right into our next topic, which is how you nurture your kids. Because if your belief about your child is he is just out to get my goat and he is choosing to misbehave like this, then parents will naturally respond with dominance, which aggravates the whole spiral. But if we come in with that belief of there's really a terrified child with a high cortisol level responding to me right now, then we can much more easily step into nurture. We can be proactive with, with nurture and really get things going on a whole different trajectory. Yeah. You said a word cortisol. I know Lisa, that's a word you talk about in the book. The before you start diving into the nurture part a little bit more, talk a little bit about the function of this thing called cortisol. I know not everybody understands it. And I think it's so important because of the relationship between cortisol, stress, fear, attachment. What is cortisol? What triggers it? What, how does it work? How is it our friend? How is it not our friend? I don't know if you can do that. And I know Lynn, you can help out a little bit too, but I think it's important for listeners because you've brought this up to just understand it a little bit to the degree that you're either qualified to share. You know, Dr. Purvis was a scientist, a developmental psychologist. And when she first started really studying these children, she ran a camp at TCU. And one of the things they did was they were measuring the, basically the brain chemistry of these children and they were doing, I think, saliva tests. And one of the things they found was that children who, these children, before they came into camp, they had twice the normal amount of cortisol in their bodies, which is a stress hormone. When they started the camp and they started meeting their needs through lots of nurture and structure and 
sensory input, they tested them again. I think it was about a week into it. And they found that these children's cortisol levels had dropped to normal levels, basically through disarming fear and meeting their needs. Mm. So we know that our kids' brain chemistry, when they are in high stress or, or we are, that part of the goal of regulation is actually correcting that brain chemistry too. Mm -hmm. Which of course then helps them sleep better and just starts a whole raft of nice changes. So speak yes. to that nurture then. I love some of the practical tips that you had about nurture. Well, nurture essentially I see as bringing our children close and really providing them with some comfort, some real direct loving attention. You know, uh, I always say the most important tool I've ever had for parenting is a rocking chair. And I have had rocking chairs. I have rocked little children. I have rocked teenagers, you know, <laughs> and they weren't always the prettiest pieces of furniture in my house. But I think rocking a child is a beautiful way to nurture. These activities are rhythmic, they're repetitive, they're relational, and they provide sensory input. Mm. And rocking a child in a rocking chair meets all four of those, checks all those boxes. You know, there are lots of other ways to do regulating activities that fit that, everything from throwing a ball back and forth to, you know, all kinds of things. But when we bring a child into the rocking chair, if they'll allow it, you know, we are giving them our, our bodies close to them. We're giving our attention. We're working with their brains to help them calm. So that's a beautiful way to nurture, I think. And when we nurture a child, we are really disarming that fear response. We're bringing them into a calm space where they feel and know that they are precious and loved, which is so very important. It seems to me that this place of nurture and I love this image of rocking. It's why parents adopt children, it's why parents often have children. It's the longing of our souls to be in this place of connectedness where nurture can happen and where that nurture then becomes the conduit of, of influence. Mm -hmm. And I worry, of course, especially when parents come to us and talk about this problem of coddle, you know, you, you shouldn't coddle these children, that they've lost their heart that fights to get to a place of nurture mm -hmm. and that they've allowed misbehavior that has all sorts of underlying reasons that are usually not what the parent thinks they are to get in the way of that nurture, that connection, that deep level heart connection. Right. I think with parents, we're so often inclined to send our children away when they are misbehaving, you know, time out. Some parents will turn their back to their child. I'm ignoring this behavior kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But what we really need to do is bring our children close. And we talk about using time in, where when your child is struggling, instead of sending them away, I used to have a, this big rocking chair right near my kitchen. We called it the think it over spot. And I'd say, hey, <laughs> sit right here sit right here. And when you're ready to talk to mommy, you just say, ready, mom, and I'll be right back. And I just keep them where I can see them. A lot of times, if my child was really dysregulated, I'd go give them a cheese stick while they're sitting in that rocking chair or maybe their water bottle, whatever, because they need to know that their bad behavior will not create separation between mm -hmm. us, you know, and that I'm going to keep them close and that I'm going to be right there when they're ready to yeah. deal with whatever's just happened. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. At Connected Families, we talk about making sure your kids hear a message loud and clear through the thick and thin of everything that you are loved no matter what. And that, yes. And that we treat them in a way that impresses that message on them as a message of identity. It's who I am. I'm mm -hmm. loved. And this image of the rocking chair as a basis, like that's, that's inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I think the eye contact stuff that you talked about is just a key piece of this as well. The nurturing of your eyes are beautiful. It's like, mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to do with how my eyes look. And so it's just such a statement of unconditional regard and caring. I was coaching some parents where, you know, the dad had come from a very strict, firm background, had a, adopted a child through a very traumatic pregnancy. And the boy was pretty aggressive, six years old. I said to him at the end of the session, I said, I think you really listened to the Holy Spirit on this one. <laughs> because he developed this game of flicking the lights off and on in the boy's bedroom at night. And the boy loved it. And I think what it was, it was a six-year-old version of peekaboo. Because it's ah. like, turn the lights on. Oh, here I am. Turn them uh -huh. off. Where did I go? Oh, here I am. And the boy just loved it and would play it <laughs> endlessly. But it's just, you know, it's like, that's where we lean into God to go, how mm -hmm. can I connect? How can I nurture? How can I get that playful interaction that communicates mm -hmm. you are delighted in? You are precious. So. Yeah. I'm wondering, as you two are talking about this and different experiences you've had with parents, if you've ever 
invited a parent to just record their eye contact and its nature with their kids between mm. today and next time we talk. You ever done anything like that? No, but I think I'll start. I mean, yeah, I'm thinking it's a good idea. We could, we could patent that right here, Lisa. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll give you the royalties and, and there we go. The, the eye contact journal. The eye contact it's, it's a good journal. idea. It's a good idea. And you know, well, and Lynn, this is something I learned when I learned more about sensory processing, which we'll talk about. But for some kids, eye contact is hard. Yeah. And for well, children I, who've I, experienced trauma, it's also hard because eye contact may have actually been a threatening thing in their past. Mm -hmm. Like making eye contact may have been dangerous for them. Looking away from their caregiver may have been safer. And so learning to make eye contact is, is hard for some kids, mm -hmm. you know? And the eye contact actually can be processed in a section of the brain that is related to aggression. So it can be very difficult. That's why it's so important not to ever say in a, in a harsh tone, look at my eyes right mm -hmm. now. You know, but that dad was totally, it was playful. It was affectionate. We learned in an OT workshop one time, just about make eye contact something your child wouldn't want to miss. Mm. Now, that's just a good phrase to help mm. capture. Yeah, that. that's beautiful. So playful, so affectionate, so inviting your child wouldn't want to miss it. So as a segue into what I would like the two of you to talk about next is I'm imagining sitting at the table with some of my favorite food in front of me, <laughs> being invited to make connective eye contact. And I have in bold letters in my notes, Lisa, as I read through the book, the power of of food as a connector. And I love that the Bible is filled with the importance of the feasts and the sharing of meals, because in the sharing of meals is so much shared culture and history. And, you know, there's just so much richness relative to food. There's a scene in the movie, Antoine Fisher. I don't know mm. if you've ever seen this, but Antoine Fisher was an abandoned young man and went into the military and got re-embraced a family that was distant. And the, the sort of culminating scene is the feast. And it's just such this great image and we know that food, you know, but I'm not talking about feasts right now. I know that food, and you, you alluded earlier to just putting beef jerky in your kids' pockets. Talk about the importance of food, especially as it relates to these traumatized kids from hard places. Mm, well, food is very important for sure. Gosh, there's so many directions I could go with that. But <laughs> yeah. one thing we've learned about building attachment is that let's say you can get your little one, not, not a baby, but a younger child into the rocking chair with you. If you can give them something sweet and something that's actually hard to chew, like a caramel, it works those deep jaw muscles, which is very calming. Mm -hmm. It gives the sweetness. <laughs> and so they begin to associate us with this calm and sweetness because, you know, basically we're taking them back to what many of them missed, which was being nursed and yeah. rocked by their mother. And so simple things like that, bubble gum, we use bubble gum for regulation a lot, not, not as much for, you know, this deep tenderness of nurture, but, you know, chewing gum is so good for helping kids calm. Having food available, like having, especially for kids who've experienced any kind of deprivation, having a basket on the counter of food that is always available, fruits, you know, healthy things, not, you know, junk, but meeting their needs for food and using food for fun too is always fun. Like mm. playing a game where you have them ask you a question with respect, like, may I have an M&M please? And you say, sure, you can have an M&M and you give it to them and you play the game back and forth, you know, just simple things like that. And then just for me, dinner around the family table, which has been really hard yeah, for sure. an, a lot of years. When you have kids who are struggling, dinner time can be really hard, but I think the rhythm of it and the anchor of it in the day is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm good friends with an adoptive mom who had a, a teenage gal that was really struggling with attachment. And she literally would sit the 16 year old in her lap and feed her a bowl of ice cream. And yeah. other parents that have not adopted children, Michael, <clears throat> that's the craziest thing I've heard in the world, but it was mm -hmm. so bonding mm -hmm. and helpful. And then she filled it with, I so wish I could have been doing this as your mom when you were just a little baby and kind mm -hmm. of strengthened. <laughs> the message of I wish I'd had you all along because you're so precious. I very mm -hmm. much right now want to get one of my mother's chewy and frozen <laughs> ginger snap cookies that you bite into and it doesn't crunch. <laughs> and it's filled with vibrant, you know, flavors of cinnamon and ginger, and brown sugar and for you. butter. And, <laughs> Sounds and delicious. My mother's love language to me to this day. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> thing I didn't speak the same love language. <laughs> 400 <laughs> pounds. 
I was going to say to you, for parents who are looking for something simpler, one thing that we did was we used a Tootsie Pop and we gave it, like my daughter would let me hold her and rock her. But rather than going to, like some parents will do a bottle, which is totally fine as well. But if I gave her a Tootsie Pop and the, the thing was that I held it and then she could kind of suck on it. But it was very hard for her. It involved so much trust and vulnerability. It was very hard for her. But I do think it's a good tool for parents to try if they're trying to build this nurture. Well, and what I hear you saying, Lisa, really between the lines here is that food is an avenue because kids want food. They like food. There's certain foods they like more than others. You know it. And Mm -hmm. to experiment with and find little by little ways of leveraging that love relationship they have with food to build a love relationship with you. And I think yes. it's important in this to just sort of help parents understand because if I'm a parent, I'm going to go, oh, so you just teach them to eat whenever they're anxious. Right. Mm-hmm. But if we build a strong connection using food in, in a little more proactive way, then we build the emotional security that's going to help them not need to regulate through external sources as much. So it's really building the stability mm-hmm that diminishes what could be a dependence yeah. on food as an emotion. Sure, sure. And you know, another way we've used food is to remind our children that they're always in our minds and hearts. And it can be so simple. Like I remember buying mangoes and bringing them home and saying to my daughter, this was very intentional. It didn't just happen. But I said to her, you know, honey, I was at the grocery store today and I saw these mangoes and I just remembered how much you love mangoes and that they were your favorite fruit in Ethiopia. So I bought these for you and these are just for you. And I'm going to put them right here. You know, just small things, but to show her that she's in my mind and heart, even when we're not together and that she's precious enough that I would do that. And how simple, right? To buy a mango. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Big statement can be made. And as we're talking about this and I'm talking about big chew and you know, there, there's also some sensory stuff. Lisa, you talked, I think in our time before we were recording just about the important role of understanding the sensory system. Talk, talk just a little bit about your journey and then You two have a conversation about, you know, uh, uh, this could go for a long time, I know. (laughs) Yeah, we could have a whole episode. Get started and and maybe (laughs) we'll do this again another time. But yeah, just the role of sensory in your journey. Well, when I was first learning and hearing about sensory processing disorder, I was in the thick of the hardest parenting. And I clearly remember telling a friend, okay, that's great, but I cannot learn about one more thing. I do not have the capacity to learn about sensory processing disorder, maybe someday. And then we were in the office of our adoption therapist and my little guy ran up to me and he smacked his head against my chin really hard. And she asked me, does that happen very often? I said, yes. I said, you know, it's like, he's so rough and he doesn't mean to be, but he's hurting me all the time. And she said, you know, why don't we have you take him for a, an evaluation with a pediatric occupational therapist? Because I'm thinking maybe there's some sensory stuff going on. <laughs> and when I heard that, and I knew that I was going to have someone actually walking it with me, like teaching me about it, I was all in because I had been attributing everything to lack of attachment. And it hadn't occurred to me that his struggle with eye contact, his not wanting me to touch him, his, you know, not like if I would kiss him on the cheek, he would wipe it away. And I was feeling it was all about this lack of attachment when in fact, I learned it was very much about sensory. So it shifted the way I looked at my son and he still has significant sensory stuff. But the great thing about sensory, and Lynn, you could talk about this, is once I understood it, there were so many tools and it actually became kind of fun to figure out his sensory needs and then meet them. Oh, I agree. I was hooked as soon as I I heard about it because it's just so intriguing. We learn about ourselves and why we do some of the things we do and why certain things stress us. And that's important information as we head into parenting, but then also what's stressful for our kids and what's not. And like I was coaching a couple who just very overwhelmed with their daughter when they were in the middle of regular schooling because she would go to school and get so overstimulated and come home and just be explosive. And as soon as COVID happened and their life calmed down, she was like a different child. Mm. And it was actually all about the sensory. So that gave them a view of what a big deal this can be. And they began to respond to her differently. 
But so many parents have talked about when they just begin to work with their kids and their sensory systems instead of against them, it can just be such a game changer, especially some of those big motor activities because our brains set for fight or flight. And if we can use up those big muscle self-protection chemicals in something fun, we've built attachment and positive brain chemicals at the same time that we've released that stress and that cortisol. I'm conscious of time, and I'd love you to talk about some of the very practical things that you were able to put in place that you found to be helpful relative to your kids' sensory needs. Well, as soon as we learned about sensory things, we bought a small trampoline that we put in the house that they could jump on. We bought some big stuffed animals that they could just sort of squeeze and be sandwiched in. You know, I had bubble gum all the time because that was a big one. I still give my kids gum when we're in church, which we haven't been able to go, but like during the sermon, because the gum is just calming, you know. Oh, there were so many things. I learned that my son slept better when he slept in this little pop-up tent. And so Mm -hmm. we put it on his bed and we got weighted blankets. I mean, we kind of went all in. We didn't do anything fancy. I mean, I've known parents who've created these incredible gyms in their home, bars on the ceiling and stuff. We weren't that awesome, but we did really begin to figure out ways to help our kids. Just recently, my daughter, who is 31, sent me these spiky rings that you can roll on your fingers Mm -hmm. when you're doing things. And I usually have them on my hands when I'm recording. I'll have one that I'm rolling. They're so cheap. You can buy them on Amazon. But my kids have started using those when they need to sit still. Like once we start Zoom calls for school, I'll definitely have a little basket of them on the table. So just fidgets, all kinds of stuff. I want to know how come I don't know about these yet. I actually (laughs) have some somewhere. Oh, (laughs) I like them. I find them calming. I play with the fidget spin. Oh Oh my God. That's still a thing. Oh yeah. I love a fidget spin. That's a good one. I know it drove all the teachers crazy, but I think they're great for kids. (laughs) Very, very kind of calming to have that spinning, you know, but it also really helped with school for sure because his teachers could, well, not, I don't just have one child with sensory issues, but their teachers could really understand simple ways to help them do better in the classroom. And every one of the children is different and has different needs and, and that makes it a challenge for teachers sometimes. Sometimes we know, but working with the child, you Mm -hmm. use that language against them. What are some other tools, some other sensory inputs that you've seen be really helpful for stressed kids? Well, certainly if you can uh, help a child before they get kind of up into that true fight or flight state, there's all sorts of good deep pressure massage, just deep pressure activities that you can do, rolling a ball across their back. That's less personal invasive than a massage, pillow squishes, things like that. You covered such a great selection of things, as well as I do kind of have a personal preference for having, you know, swings in the house and that kind of thing. (laughs) It sounds a little crazy, but boy, is that, that was so helpful for us. And sleeping bags, pillows at the bottom bottom of the 14 run of stairs yeah. and sleeping bags. And yeah, but it's such a statement of care it makes for our kids when we, especially when they know it's kind of unconventional, right? Like yeah. we, get to, we get to have a swing in the basement? Yeah. Really? Well, yes, here's why. And here, mm-hmm. you know, here's how it's best used. And you know, here's when it'll be okay to use and here's when it's not okay to use. And mm-hmm. you know, setting boundaries and limits around that, around this issue. And it's really the last thing we have any time for at all is the issue of of still in this context of working with our children, making sure that there is respect, making sure that respect is modeled, and then that we invite our kids to respectful behavior over and over again. How do we do that without disenfranchising them again? How did you do that? Well, it's how am I currently doing it too? (laughs) Because I'm parenting teens, you know, and again, I think the first thing was beginning to use the script, which we talked about in the previous episode of just when my child would say something demanding or rude, just being able to say to them, hey, try that again with respect and giving them a chance to say it again. Now they may or may not choose to do that, but that would be one of the first things that I still do to remind them of respect. And I do try to always model it with them. And I'm not perfect at all, but I try to speak to my kids with respect and never be like derogatory or mocking. You know, when parents get really burned out, it's easy to get into some patterns of really treating our children without respect. And then of course, they're not going to give it back to us. You know, Mm -hmm. I think we also have to be realistic for those people who are adoptive and foster parents that 
children who come to us later in life, they have no foundation for this. They're, they can't even imagine why they should give you respect. Mm-hmm. And so you have to build this over time and understand that it, it's something they're going to have to learn over time. So it takes time, little by little, that mm-hmm. script. Try again with respect. Mm-hmm. Respect, buddy. Remember? Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just mm-hmm. And keep going back to that place, keeping our hearts calm. Well, Lisa, I, I get the sense that we could have a really wonderful evening together <laughs> as couples. At some point, maybe if we get out your way or you ours, we'll look forward to doing something like that. But folks, we've been talking really about ideas that are so beautifully captured in this book, The Connected Parent, that's co-authored by Lisa and Dr. Karen Purvis. And we're going to let you know in show notes how to get a hold of that. And certainly you can visit, Lisa, just say a little bit about your website, how, how people could reach you directly to you. Okay. They can find me at onethankfulmom.com. Onethankfulmom.com. Uh, yes, that's my website. And they can find me on social media as One Thankful Mom. And I also have a podcast called The Adoption Connection. So they can find me there as well. All right, Lisa. Well, a tremendous joy. Linda's tending to her next appointment here. Evidence that we could keep talking, right? But thank you for joining us so much. And we look forward to talking again. All right. Thank you so much. All right. God bless. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Families podcast. We hope you got tips that you can use in your parenting today. Please subscribe and leave us a positive review so other families can find us and learn how to parent with peace and connection. To learn more about Connected Families, visit ConnectedFamilies.org.